Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And joining me, uh, someone who I haven't podcasted with in a little bit, but someone who I have uh, an immeasurable amount of podcasting experience with, he is the host of WrestleNomics. He has become an extremely reliable source for wrestling business information and just wrestling information, uh, period. And he's recently become a favorite of some of the most powerful people in wrestling media, such as Eric Bischoff and Dave Shear. Brandon, it's Brandon Thurston. Brandon, how are you? I'm I'm doing I'm doing well. I'm I'm getting over illness, mild illness, but I'm I'm doing fine. I'm I'm glad I can um <clears throat> feed people the things that that they need to nourish them. Mm-hmm. Dropping that sweet sweet engagement. Uh, you you don't see you have you're you're cornering the market here where you're you're not engagement bait. But you provide the information for engagement bait. I mean, I've been on Eric Bischoff's podcast a couple of times, and we have had, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've heard yourself and others um, speak about his content, and I thought we had pretty civil conversations. I, I haven't really listened uh, to to the podcasts that everybody talks about and gets upset about, but I thought we had a, a decent conversation. Um, but I understand there's a lot of. Uh, Stuff that I do, including I, especially it seems like that financial report I did at the end of the year or the beginning of this year on the prior year, uh, where I concluded that AEW is not profitable. I think I really, really gave people what they were craving there. Yeah, and if you if you now, but you're not at the point where like you're the authority on this, even Am though I? you're well, like if you actually you're listening read, and seeing things that I don't. If you actually wrote, you know, if you actually read what you wrote, which is this, you know estimates and analysis right mm-hmm. but because you gave people what they wanted some people what they wanted it is now like well if brandon thurston says they're not profitable then there's no way that there's they're profitable even well, if your analysis is there's no way that they're profitable though. Yeah. like i'm super confident in that am i confident yeah. in the number of profitability that i got no and in fact i've been told after the fact that the number that i assumed for talent cost was way too high um mm-hmm. But still, I don't think that they're that they're profitable, or if if they, I I I think that they they are losing money, and that's not that shouldn't come as a shock to anybody who's paying attention, uh, because this this is a company that you, I wouldn't expect to have made money until they make they make a new TV deal, which they still have not yet. But if they do, I mean that that's what this whole business plan is premised on that you get a big enough TV deal in the second round to become profitable. But Brandon, I've been watching Who Killed WCW, and WCW was only not profitable for like a year and a half, and they went out of business. Isn't that the, isn't the exact same scenario happening now with AEW Dynamite? AEW is probably not going to go out of business if they get a good enough TV deal, though. But they're losing money. That means you're going out of business. How long can you stay in business if you're losing money? Until you run out of funding. <laughs> who's who's funding AEW AEW um, all elite wrestling is it somebody with financial resources or is it like uh, a carny promoter from the old days ultimately this is this is money coming from shad khan who has uh-huh. uh who owns the, the jaguars fulham uh flex and gate they have billions and billions of dollars i mean presumably even if they get a disappointing tv deal and they cannot be profitable i mean if shad wants to pay for it i suppose it will exist in some form Yes, and, and to be more serious, there's a um, – that's ultimately – I think even though we're, what, five years into AEW, we're past five years now into AEW's existence, um, AEW's greatest strength in terms of its overall potential as a company, I think, is largely that it is the, – the, it is a very intensely personal project for someone that has an enormous amount of money. Uh, and it is not a line item in a giant conglomerate um, like some wrestling companies have historically been, whether that was WCW or even like TNA when they were with Panda, when they were owned by Panda Energy. Um, and like really rich people have a lot of expensive ways to spend their money. Like Tony could be really into yacht racing. He could be really into building his own spaceship. He could be really into 
exploring the the, the 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 oceans and trying to find sunken ships like these are all things that billionaires have spent their money on over the years and they have caught and they i assume they have spent a lot more money than tony khan has with a lot less of a promise of potentially turning making turning into a revenue generating project you could buy social media platforms yeah perfect perfect example like i think in, in, in tony uh i think to the betterment of of wrestling fans everywhere, whether they want to admit it or not, and certainly to wrestlers and people within the wrestling industry, has chosen that his his way he's going to spend money is going to be to run a professional wrestling company, um, and that gives AEW far more uh, leeway than I think. Pretty much, I don't know. Would you say they have like more than any other wrestling company ever in terms of just the ability to? take on losses and remain a project just because it is the person who's running it is, is, is so, you know, independently wealthy, or at least the family that's running it is wealthy. I guess like if we were thinking about other startup wrestling companies, I mean, the, the costs of running a wrestling show, even if we were to adjust for inflation is, mm -hmm. is so much higher. I think the just the, especially like a, an arena show right. with national television level production right we're going like back that. in time we're in studios for the most mm -hmm. part right where the costs are much much lower and but but we're in this era of wrestling history which is so vastly different from uh you know the, like these 20 years of wrestling history are, are i guess i don't know monday night wars and forwards something like that mid 90s and forward is, is so vastly different just in terms of a production element compared to what came before it in that yeah they're, they're spending i mean if you look at that nevada report um that I talked about a month ago that people are digging up today. Um, they supposedly spent like almost $4 million on collision and double or nothing in, in Las Vegas um, mm -hmm. to give you some idea of the, of what it costs to run a major wrestling show with the kind of production values that, that they, that they have um, in the kinds of arenas that they run them in. Um, it's really, really expensive. So, yeah, I mean the, the, the amount of money that you need to run a major wrestling company is, is way way more than any other any other startup. I don't know will the other startups even be. You know, I guess you know. I don't. I don't know if you would call WCW a startup because it was it was a purchase of Jim Crock Promotions. Yeah, I mean T TNA would be a startup, right? True. Yeah. Um. And that was and costs were kept relatively low because they were taping a, a couple pay per views at a at a sitting. I think. Yeah, I mean their business model was was totally different. Um, but and very quickly they needed a a major financial partner like t and tna okay like a very a billion i don't know if the carters are billionaires were they i have no idea i don't know panda energy but the, 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 the talent spend is certainly lower yeah well but extremely wealthy family purchased tna and i don't know what i've never really understood like the whether that was like they did that because like how how entwined dixie carter was into like really wanting to run a wrestling company um i don't think she was as dedicated to it as Tony Khan is. I don't think it was a lifelong passion the way it clearly is for Tony. Um, but that allowed TNA to to find, I think, to, to sustain, whether it's sustain losses um, and to go forward. And, and I mean, and, but realistically, you know, the TV industry is so much more profit, is so much more profitable or has so much more profit. So you can, we can talk about, it costs four million dollars to tape, you know, episode of Collision in a, in a pay per view, but the theoretical, you know, pot at the of gold at the end of the rainbow that comes from when you get a, a large paying TV deal is so much more lucrative than um, in in generations past, and it's hard to compare with because I think everyone focuses on like when we talk about the death of WCW, I think there's so much focus on television ratings and maybe like a little bit of a focus on like pay-per-view buy rate. Um, and people focus on those things going down, but especially like television ratings were not necessarily particularly lucrative for WCW during that time period. It was, they were lucrative as an at potential, making them a potential asset to a television partner, which was seen as necessary to exist. But really what killed WCW was their at attendances went down. Their house shows went way down. Um, and those are the numbers that no one really – people don't discuss nearly as much. But when you look at the real collapse of WCW, it's right there in the attendance figures. Because, and that was the most important aspect of their business. Yeah, and pay-per-view went way down too. I think I've looked a little bit at their attendance. It's harder to 
to gather attendance numbers that I think are really reliable. What we have is basically what's in newsletters and what at this point are on wrestling database websites. Right. But they have, and they have, but they have like really dramatic swings. Like there's a year, I think there's a year where they, they did a nitro at the, um, the dome in St. Louis. I forget what it's called now. I think it used to be called like the trans world dome. And I think it's, it's called like the mall or something. Dome. Do you know what I'm talking about? Edward James dome. Is it where the Rams played? Yeah. Um, the they dome did like at America center is what it's called. Yeah. Now. The dome at America center. That's what it is. Um, but uh, it was, I think it was called the Edward, Edward James dome. And like, they ran a nitro there and they did like Edward think, Jones dome. Yeah. I think they did like over 20,000 tickets for a nitro. And like a year later they went back and they did like 4,000 or something like that. Just like a really dramatic shift downward um, in their attendances. But I, I think and the reason I wanted to have you on was to kind of have a macro discussion about both WWE and AEW's business. And as, as me and, and Warren Hayes discussed on the last edition of this podcast, AEW's business trends in a lot of different ways over the last year are, are, are trending downward. And I think I, I don't want to focus on any individual factors as much as I want to look at what are the major reasons for that? And consequently, what are what are the major reasons for WWE's current trends? Um, and I think I'll start with proposing this hypothesis that AEW's business being down, whether it's attendance or television ratings, is a direct consequence from WWE's pop, you know attendance and, and ratings going up. Do you would you agree with that statement? I think it's a major factor. Do you think it's yes. the biggest? Do you think it's the biggest factor? Probably. Yeah, I think it is too. Um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I've always thought that if 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 Raw, if especially if particularly if Raw and SmackDown are viewed as like must see television, um, which for when. AW started, I think there were a lot of WWE fans that did not feel that way. It became more appealing to watch Dynamite because you're week to week. Uh, you had more time on a week to week basis to dedicate to watching wrestling. But I think over the last year and a half or so, both Raw and SmackDown have generally become much more important to the typical WWE fan. And whether or not, what, what kind of regardless of what AEW is doing, and obviously what AEW is doing from a creative perspective is a factor. But I, I think kind of regardless for that, they're going to lose viewers because people are just be like, well, I was watching this, but now I'm kind of back more into WWE. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not completely zero sum, but there is, I think, you know, in around 2022, maybe the middle of 2022, could argue maybe there's there's hints of it earlier in that year that the the problem that aw was addressing changed it became it went from being a remedy to wb being terrible to it has to be something else there has to be some some new reason for aw to exist now all that's not to say that aw can't coexist alongside a very successful and very popular WWE. I think there is room in this economy for two two wrestling companies the size of, of those two. But the whole opportunity for AEW existing was created by Vince McMahon uh, throughout the 2010s by mm -hmm. disenfranchising a slew of wrestling fans and eventually wrestling talent that were not creatively satisfied fans that were not satisfied with the viewing experience and that created along with other things that were essential as well um that created this opportunity and now when wwe started to satisfy more fans in 2022 that changes the equation for for AEW. and i wish we could have an honest conversation with tony at some point to to ask him if he even recognizes that and how do you address that if that, if you accept that premise which i think you should 
Uh, I think there are other factors, including I think the identity of AEW has become less defined rather than more defined it's since that time. And you've created a whole lot of volume in the form of collision uh, that's affected ratings and live events. Well, one thing I wanted to point out is, and I think it is a factor, is when, when AEW was first starts in 2019 and into 2020 and probably into 2021 as well, the comparison point for its product was largely how does it compare to WWE? Um, and WWE was, I think, struggling from a creative perspective. I think WWE, like, especially during the first, before they kind of came up with the Thunderdome concept, like, atmospherically really struggled during the early days of the pandemic in a way that I think, a I think AEW's atmosphere um, for the first five or six months of the pandemic was vastly superior to WWE's. I think, like, you watch like the WrestleMania that they had at the performance center before they did the Thunderdome. And it, it's just like, literally you can hear a pin drop in the ring. Like that is a really bad product to watch. Um, and that came during a period where AEW was doing compared to today, relatively well against WWE. But as AEW got older and as more, they established more of a track record, AEW, product is now largely compared to its, itself, right? It's prior self. We now have references for what AEW can or maybe should be. And that maybe has alienated some fans as the product has changed. And the product changing is a natural evolution. The product is never going to be the same as it was five years ago. It really shouldn't be. Um, but for whatever, but I, I think the, the, the biggest factor in this is there were a lot of people that were watching AEW that still had a preference for the WWE product if it were to be better. And the large and the, and the, and the assumption is generally that it is better. Um, it has been for quite some time now. And that makes it more difficult for AEW to attract the kind of attention it needs to continue to draw fans to live events. and, and Especially NXT. People love NXT draw. now. Yeah, so it seemed like NXT was doing like really well when you know they had, and they had like you know Becky Lynch and like Dominic Mysterio dropping down like around it was probably like around like was last fall last summer that was happening. Yeah, throughout twenty twenty three, and it's it seemed like you know NXT's television ratings were doing quite well, um, and then you know they kind of they kind of curbed some of the main roster involvements, and it seemed like they were kind of going back down and then kind of i would say almost like inexplicably to me this last month or so really going back up during a time where raw and smackdown have you know have kind of been suffering from the post wrestlemania malaise that people that 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 annually kind of happens a lot of the time um but for whatever reason the investment in nxt particularly in the the key demo uh has gone way up um, and I'm not sure if that's individual wrestlers getting hot or, or what that do, do you have any, like, what are, do you have any thoughts on kind of what has led to the NXT increase, like specifically in like last month or so? I, I don't know that I can tell you I've watched an episode of NXT in the last year. Um, so I, well, I you're not wanna... a child, so I, I would imagine you didn't. <laughs> well, look, hey, there's people of all ages. The total audience is up 14%. You're, in this me month. you're mentally not a child. So I was surprised. <laughs> the demo it. is way up. And, but look, it's something they're doing is connecting with the audience. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's what the business metrics tell yeah. us, at least the, te the key demo television ratings. But I don't. Like, is it because Trick Williams is, like, turning into a big star? And look, if, if if that's the case, he should be on the main roster if he could move the key demo like this. Um, is it, you know, I, I think, like, Le Levesque taking control um, of, of the main roster helped reignite some interest in NXT because fans realized that if the talent they get invested in in NXT has a much better chance of getting a sincere push on the main roster with Levesque in charge than did with Vince McMahon, which I think hurt NXT's business um, and the investment people had in NXT's talents towards the end of Vince's reign in charge of creative. Mm -hmm. But is it, has WWE, one of the things, this is like a fear of mine, but like has WWE unlocked a way to present wrestling to young people through NXT, which is this very over the top, uh, like wacky characters everyone has like this this 
an over the top gimmick. It's very, it's really focused on young people, people in their early twenties, attractive people. Um, like, have they kind of like unlocked a presentation of pro wrestling to uh, a, a young key demographic that no one had kind of touched uh, or had people haven't been able to reach in years? I don't know. I I would say this is part of the story is that W has gotten more popular. So of course NXT has gotten more popular. But as as you said, we've seen the the year over year comparisons for Raw and SmackDown, they're not negative yet, like on the whole, I'm really mm-hmm. by on the whole. Like by by the by the month, you know, in this month, uh SmackDown is is starting to, to go down, especially that one low rating they had. But but they're doing okay. But obviously NXT is doing way, way better. And maybe yeah, just... Raw and SmackDown feel like they're on a relatively predictable ratings trend from what we've come to expect with WWE, especially if you look at where they were like four or five months ago, building up to WrestleMania, The Rock is around, they've got the Roman Reigns Cody thing heating up, obviously that was huge for ratings, and then you look now, no Rock, no Roman Reigns, like obviously, you know, WrestleMania is kind of past it goes back down, that's just what we see almost every year with WWE, but for whatever reason, NXT... Um, and I guess despite like a really identifiable like angle or uh, star has just been able to really generate a lot of interest. Although, of course, you know, they put Cody Rhodes on NXT last week um, in the ratings. I think they look the keep demo went down than from from the week before for the whole show. Yes. Yeah. Um, after he. After his segment there's a, a, a pretty big tune out. Yeah. So they were there for his segment and that, you know, it seems like you know, people tuned in and check. But that would, and, and but that would still influence the rating. You have all these people tuning in just yeah, to see Cody yeah. when they presumably would not be tuning in other weeks when Cody is not there. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously they did great this week. Um, but that's something that I've been trying to like, I've been kind of worried about cause I'm like, Oh man, is this like the future of pro wrestling? Is this really, is this like, it's like this NXT, like really fake looking drama with the backstage skits and is that connecting with like you know the tiktok generation in a way that like traditional pro wrestling doesn't and like it's just a really what is what is different about nxt versus main roster i i find nxt's um like the the average person the average person in nxt has a really over the top defined gimmick like as a character than i think on the main roster um i think that there is a lot more of a focus on like not necessarily even like backstage um segments but character work which is like and i'm i'm sorry i don't know the names of these people but like there's the girl that runs a bar there's the Chase U people. There's all the people that are like students at the Chase U University, which is like this weird, bizarre Disney Channel school pair, like school drama that takes place within Chase U. Um, just an incredible career change for Harlem Bravado. Um, they all have great they, names. Uh, like they all have names like people of people you've never met before. Uh, JC Jane, life. Jasmine Nix, Lola Vice, yeah. Jakara look- Jackson. And I think, I mean, this this is not a new concept in the in the in the annals of like television, but finding really attractive people in their twenties and putting them on television like a pseudo reality format has proven to be a success for a lot of different shows. And I do think NXT skews more towards that as opposed to the main roster, specifically if you look at the biggest stuff on the main roster, whether it's with, with you know whatever Cody is doing or even like what Drew McIntyre is doing, like seems more rooted in traditional pro wrestling and less focused on like what I would consider like over the top character work. But I do think that that is, I I do think that might be resonating with fans. Sure. Well, and, and, and not just fans, but people who have limited affinity or interest in pro wrestling prior to kind of tuning in. And I think that is a really, really important distinction when we talk about WWE's growth in their fan base is for the for, for years and years it seemed like WWE's only way to generate interest was through nostalgia, which was a wrestler from the past coming back and propping up the show. And obviously this year you had The Rock doing that. I do think that The Rock, because he's such a major celebrity, 
um kind and i of think trains. vince only trust only trusted people that he had trusted in Correct. the past He's like, ah, to, I need to make Wrestle. Yeah. I need to make WrestleMania feel special. <laughs> I got to get Undertaker on this card. He's going to wrestle Shane yeah. McMahon in a Hell in a Cell, which in a lot of cases it worked. Like that was the, the biggest stuff for WrestleMania was often the stuff that was built around part time wrestlers. I mean, it's millennials, right? Um, but with especially with whether it's like this NX growth, the NXT audience, or just a lot of people getting into the WWE product, I think there's a lot more people that don't have. 10 plus years of experience watching pro wrestling and those people can kind of be uh like influenced and molded in, in a very different way than people that come in with you know expectations a lot of it stemming from what they remember when they were children that the way wrestling should should or should not be um and i think perhaps with the nxt especially with the, the growth in the younger demographics um that is playing a factor i think like I, I, I'm interested in knowing what you think about this, but like when CM Punk has been been on WWE television and he's made some mentions about um, things like whether it's alluding to AEW or even stuff that happened in his past in WWE and the crowd not really reacting the way that you would expect them to react. Um, and is that a sign that there's a lot of people that are watching the WWE product that are really unaware of CM Punk's history at all? Um, and to them, he's just like a, a wrestler that they know used to wrestle in the company and is supposed to be a big deal, but they don't really know anything about CM Punk, uh, and a pipe bomb promo and, and all that. They, they like, what are the examples of that? So he's, he's like alluded to AEW and has gotten no response when he thought it would. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm going to have to think off the top of my head now. Um, but he said stuff about the young boxer or, or backstage, or is, I think it was Drew saying like a backstage fight or something like that. Um, but if you watch his promos, you'll see like they're very different than his AEW promos. Where like, and if you watch any AEW promo, right? If someone mentions something that happened in WWE, the crowd gives a big reaction. Like mm -hmm. I think like Will Ospreay on this week's Dynamite said, you know, well, you had a hit row, I had a hit list when he was mm -hmm. talking to Swerve Strickland, which is obviously a reference, and that gets a big reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in WWE, maybe that used to be the case like three or four years ago. But it seems like now the fan base is not as interested in the past. I mean, do we even have any examples of that? Like if we go three three years ago, it's 2021. And we've just – I mean at this point three years ago, there's still no fans in, in, in attendance. There's just yeah. Thunderdome people uh, on, on, on Zoom. Hey, those people, were, those people were reacting big though, Brandon. That's right. They were – Are you were implying that though so. – are you, are you implying um, that those were not natural organic reactions? Like, I don't know if that we have examples. And I think clearly like something happened around 2020 that has thereafter resulted in a more compliant, less angry crowd. And maybe that's just the, I, the outlet that is AEW in that you have this alternative that is a yes. NBA-sized arena mm -hmm. wrestling program with high production values. Yeah. G Garrett Kidney, TNA historian, host of the You've Got to Be Kidding Me podcast. Uh he has he's pointed this out several times and he he and I and it's a really fascinating thought, which is like something happened to the WWE fan, specifically like during like the pandemic, really like when the Thunderdome started, really when Roman Reigns turned heel. Um mm -hmm. that changed fan perception of the product. And that was further um like uh multiplied when Vince stepped down the first time and Triple H took over and there was at least the perception that Paul Levesque was in charge, uh, even though he kind of wasn't. And now, obviously, he seems to fully be in charge of the creative end of the company for the most part. And that kind of really reinvigorated the company's faith. And I mean, the fans base's faith in the WWE product. And to Levesque's credit, he's delivered, I think, enough times for that faith to continue to be rewarded in fans he hasn't lost them yet um there's some people you're never going to lose but i do think that he's nailed some of the big stuff he eventually put cody over at wrestlemania over roman reigns um triple h put him over too yeah triple h yes triple h put, came out and put him out he didn't he really didn't want to come out to the ring but he just they demand you know they demanded to see him he had to come out you know he never triple h he never wanted tv time in his career he just He's a very humble, humble man. Um, 
but they've done that you know they brought he brought cm punk back to the company which obviously mm-hmm. i think there's gonna be like what they, i think they keep they're they're gonna sell out the 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 building in chicago for tonight we're taping this on friday june 21st they're mm-hmm. selling they're gonna sell out the chicago building. i think they said like fourteen thousand. there's they're probably releasing seats um probably right up until bell time but they effectively have sold out that building um and i think that's largely because they have cm punk back um like there's been enough to you know deliveries on stuff and, and even little stuff like making the intercontinental championship matter i think that appeals to a certain segment of fans or um you know even like you know, okay, LA Knight got over. He's really not a top guy, but let's have him work this short program with Roman Reigns, have him wrestle him, uh, you know, in the main event uh, of, a, of a, a PLE. Uh, stuff that maybe Vince wouldn't have never done, um, mm-hmm. or the, at least the perception is that Vince would have never done it. And I think that has has helped reestablish that fan base. And those fans are satisfied with the WWE product. Um, and it will take... You know, I'll, I'll, as, as we saw in the past, like a lot of miscues to lose them again. Um, mm. I do think if we accept the premise that, you know, WWE being hot has had a negative impact on AEW's ability to attract interest, especially in, if we're talking about like swing fans uh, who are continuing to elect to spend time and money on WWE's product, maybe in, in, instead of spending that same time and money on AEW's product. You know, does if what happens if WWE cools off a bit? And, and they have kind of cooled off in certain business metrics over the last, at least Ron SmackDown have in the last few months kind of coming out of WrestleMania. Um but if they if they cool off further and, and no company stays hot forever, if we accept that you know WWE's been hot for 18 months, that's actually quite a long period of time historically in pro wrestling. Um to, to be to be hot um if we're like a year from now and WWE's going back down does that again does that um open up an opportunity for AEW to kind of surge back in sort of i mean it has to be it has to be like making fans i mean ideally it's making fans dissatisfied and disgruntled again i don't see that happening right. like my my theory it would take pre- a while for that to happen again my theory pre aw is that wrestling this will be some real revisionist history but but wrestling could be could be a lot more popular if you had somebody directing creative that was a lot better uh than vince was and i don't think it was that hard to be better to be as good as paul levesque is Mm -hmm. um and it would just be at this sort of normal stasis of popularity that i think we're seeing now if you just kept got got the impediment out of the way and it's out of the way now and it's different i know people do a lot of people are, are still don't like it and still don't see it as, as that different i think that's an interesting subject to discuss if they can ever win over those people and if that's a significant number never they'll never, never. win they'll never they'll, win us over they'll, they'll never win over jesse um but I, I honestly i seriously i can't imagine ever like being a wwe fan again <laughs> there's just he, too much there's too much there yeah but I think this is just, this is what the business always could have been. What, what WWE is now, this is what they could have been throughout the 2010s. That that this level of of popularity, um, and I think like is is it has it cooled? I I don't really accept that it's it's cooled. Um, if you look at the the update in the in the demo, that's mm-hmm. you know year year differences in the demo for four straight quarters for Raw are at least slightly up, and the same thing for SmackDown for this quarter yeah. and the, and the trailing three. Yeah, when I say cool, I I just am comparing it to where it was like three or four months ago, like in the build up to WrestleMania when you had the Rock around and you had those television ratings, you had the big you know uh, sellout streak that they had through March. Sure, um, and that's seasonal, right? And year right, well, year. that's what I mean. Like, I think there's a belief that they can right now. There's a belief that they could heat back up if the Rock were to come back, like next year, if the Rock is going to wrestle Cody at WrestleMania or something like that, that they can easily hit that level again with the Rock's involvement. It'll be interesting to see when Roman Reigns comes back to television. It might be relatively soon. Um, like if, if they do, you know, a Roman Cody match or something, like if that's the main event of SummerSlam, um, which I kind of, which I think it probably should be, but it might not be. Um, like if that significantly boosts things back up. Um, 
I think I think with AEW to to to, to kind of shift the conversation, I think a little bit further uh, uh, away from like WWE's influence on AEW. I think, and I said this on the last episode, like I think the entire like CM Punk debacle and how that was handled and what ultimately ended up happening from that was damaging to AEW's perception amongst uh, potential swing fans or casual fans. I think even right or wrong, um, it made AEW look like a minor league company. It made um, Tony Khan look like someone that couldn't be trusted in a key creative position, like we're talking about with their fa WWE's fans against Vince. I think there are people out there that don't believe Tony Khan is is a capable creative mind, which prevents them from investing in the product. Um, part of that is because that agenda has been pushed by a lot of people in the wrestling industry with podcasts and such. But I do think that that's a factor, the idea that I don't know if I can get invested in this product, even if I might see something that I like, because I don't trust the guy in charge. Because The Undertaker told me that uh, he's he's he doesn't think he's a good guy in charge. Um, I, th I think but with, with, with the punk drama, we, f we focus so much on the punk drama itself and probably not enough on the result, which is... Mm -hmm. He lost by far the biggest draw that AEW's ever had. Yeah. Um, and I think we under... Not under just lost, but he just totally torched the company like on the way out and hammered yeah. home you know, negative perceptions about the Young Bucks, about the EVPs, about Tony, all of that stuff. Um, you know, and Hangman think, Page. Like, and I think what's under-recognized too, in addition to Punk leaving, is, is Cody leaving. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Now the biggest he, the biggest drawing card in rest, full time wrestler in in wrestling, right? Um, and he's he's done so great for for WWE. Mm -hmm. Maybe that tells you like I I would not have expected. I, I'm mildly surprised by how well he's done in WWE. Not just because it's WWE, but like sort of that that besides, I I would not expect that he would be like the biggest star. I would not bet on that he would be like the biggest star in in WWE to, to, to whatever extent he is. I mean, um, he has he has been utilized really well. That dates back to when Vince, you know, when Vince was still in charge. But they really, you know, at the time, they really needed somebody fresh to step in. Uh, someone that hadn't been killed by bad booking within WWE for years and years. And they needed that person to come in and be their top baby face. And Cody was the perfect person to do that. And so like, in a sense, maybe two of the biggest stars that mm -hmm. you liked from AEW, they're not in AEW anymore. You can get them from the other company. Yeah. And in hindsight, like, man, like Cody doing the thing where he decided he was going to never be able to challenge for the AEW World Championship. As a whoever's decision that was, as a potential mistake in hindsight, like would AEW be in a completely different position if, you know, Cody had a long run as champion at the early portion of the company? I, um, I really think, and, and that's all premised on them being EVPs, right? If they're not EVPs, they don't have the power that they're that they have. That's not that that's not something that you necessarily have to do to to the extent, right? Right. They think, were like, crazily concerned about the idea that they were going to book them. They, they, they didn't want people thinking they were booking themselves to go over, mm -hmm. even if they were all, for the most part, all collectively like the biggest stars in the company. I, um, I think if, if somehow you can make, wave a magic wand and restart AEW under any conditions, obviously mm -hmm. them being EVPs was what really helped make that deal. I don't know if you can make that deal in reality mm -hmm. without it, but if, if you could restart AEW without them being EVPs, any of the four, um, I think that would be to, to AEW's benefit greatly, right? Because you you have less of a cause for the drama between Punk and the Bucks because the Bucks aren't aren't EVPs with the power that they have. They're talent only. I guess I, guess. I kind of think of CM Punk as an inevitable time bomb yes. uh, that CM was Punk. going to to detonate at any time. Uh, in whether he's not, not detonated yet in in WWE. Well, he's he's been injured. They've kept them and they've kept them uh, warded off. I mean, there's a lot of things about going on with him and wwe and, and i think maybe he respects the people in wwe in a way that he never respected the people in, in aw or at least yeah. pop, would be willing to think that um, yeah and, and look i think tony is what what do you think motivates tony i have some thoughts but what do you think i think tony wants to see his creative vision come to what creation. is his creative vision though what, what he thinks in his head is the angles and, and stuff that he wants to do, who he wants the champion to be, how he wants to get there. I think 
that is ultimately like the, the, it's it's a, it's a real creative endeavor for him. It's not focused entirely on business metrics. It's not focused on putting out a product that gets a lot of praise online. Although I think that is important, more important yeah. to him than, well, than what other are the characteristics of Tony Khan's creative vision. Mm -hmm. He wants to tell very long stories. He wants someone to go on a very long journey to win something. We've seen that with like how they use Hangman Page, even how they really delayed MJF's world title win. Um, the entire MJF Adam Cole saga. I think he has ideas that he really wants to execute over the long term, and he wants to tell these these long character defining stories, which, when done well, um, can be really important to your company, but it's all can, can be really beneficial to your company, but they're very difficult to do because there's a million variables that go into that. Um, and I think the, the longer, the more your company is around, the harder it becomes to put those things together. But I think ultimately, like, what is Tony, like, what do you think Tony's motivations are? No, as I told someone earlier today, I, I think his main motivator is a kind of self interest that's like, it's, there's a lot of, wanting to please people he has described himself as a as a people pleaser yeah. i think and that's I, more of a personality trait than like a, like a real goal like i think he does this is what what motivates yeah. and what makes him do the things that he does mm -hmm. and he wants to work with people and please people and i think he's willing to compromise a lot of what might might have been his mid-south tony creative vision mm -hmm. at the beginning he's willing to acquiesce a lot and I think he probably internalizes it as it, it's all what he wants to do, but he's willing to compromise a lot to work with people that he enjoys working with. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that and that, makes, and that, that results that in AW not really having a strong identity. Yeah, I, I think was... it probably results in him not being the strongest leader and, and manager of talent. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it makes AW a weaker company than it would be otherwise if they had, you know, those qualities in, in more positive uh, attributes. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that on the last pod, right? Which is, I think, like, the reason AEW maybe has large tonal shifts from segment to segment is because the talent has a lot of freedom to do what they want to do, especially the the talent that is on um, the more established side or the higher pay grade or, or getting more TV time or however you want to define them. And a lot of those people have really various visions of what they want their pro wrestling character to be. And Although they're not committing murders yet in AEW like they are in WWE. Um, but I think that having a, a stronger creative vision and identity is, is more important for AEW than it is mm -hmm. for WWE because you got to be something that I'm not getting from WWE. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think like, I'm okay with the company being, having a diverse type of product. I don't need really like a, like the company to have this really strong natural identity. I mean, I, I'm definitely higher on the AEW product than I think most people are. Um, even when their product gets, you know, really poor reviews from, from members of the hardcore circle, I'm still like overall pretty positive on the product. But I do think that there are certain things that they have done in recent the last year or so, particularly, you know, a lot of it comes down to like the MJF title reign, which was very sports entertainment E the whole Adam Cole saga. And even now, like you dedicated so much time to the Adam Cole MJF saga with the, the world title picture and all this stuff. MJF gets hurt. Adam Cole's hurt. Well, Adam Cole's hurt. So he can't wrestle. And then MJF gets hurt. MJF comes back. And that's like totally in the background. Like, shouldn't that be the first program MJF did when he came back and instead he's not doing that? That sends a, like, what's the message that you're getting from fans? Like, if you're just a regular, if you're a fan, like, I expected him to wrestle Adam Cole. Like, I don't really, I'm kind of glad he's not doing it because I didn't really want to see it necessarily. But it did seem like that would be, like, the creative vision was to do that. And now he's back and he's, like, doesn't really care about Adam Cole that much. It seems like he's going to feud with Will Ospreay eventually. Um, I don't know if that's Adam Cole's not ready to come back yet or, or what exactly that is. But I think like the MJF title reign, which was very sports entertainment E, I think it definitely alienated some fans. I don't know how large of a portion of the AEW fan base that actually is, but certainly the people that I hear from a lot, very upset about it. Um, 
but I, I do think like if we're talking about like when did you when did you lose some of those more casual AEW fans? When did you lose some of those maybe fans like, ah, I'm going to go back and watch WWE more, or I'm going to skip Dynamite this week, or I'm not going to order this pay-per-view. I do think a lot of it comes down to ultimately like how C the CM Punk situation evolved and how it was handled in a way that did not make AEW look good at all. And maybe there was no way to handle that situation. And make the, it, you probably could have done it better than they did. But I don't know if there was any way to to get that situation and make the company look good when if you have a star like CM Punk who brought people to the product, who brought people there just to see CM Punk, we saw that enough times um, to justify that. Um, when it, it, I don't know if there's a way if that guy just decides he's going to explode, which is basically what ended up happening there's a way to handle that where your company looks really great because there's a lot of people that are emotionally invested in whatever, what CM Punk says and does about it. I also think like, you know, the collision was founded as a CM Punk show and then he just exploded and left, which I think probably doesn't get talked about as much. Um, but like the entire brand of collision was built around CM Punk and then he destroyed the, just, you know, tried to torch the company on his way out. And so now you have this show, which, um, I think in terms of like trying to not make it a B show, I, I do think that they, they dedicate a lot of creative effort to collision in a way that they never did for Rampage, but it was supposed to be the CM Punk show and they lost CM Punk. And I think that really set collision up on a, on a, on a as no, not, not, it didn't necessarily set collision up to fail, but I definitely think it's hurt collisions ability to attract interest and feel important. I guess uh, another question I think is interesting and sorry, it has to be a contrast to WWE, is name quickly for the top three stars in WWE. Mm -hmm. Full-time or? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, general, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would, you, I'd just basically whether, whether you classify Roman as full-time or not. Like Cody, obviously. I'll say Cody, Roman, and I, I mean, I would say Punk, right? Like, I guess the third is harder to define, right? Yeah, Cody he's Roman. around enough. I would say probably, probably else. Drew. Okay, um, so n name the top three stars for AEW. Right, it's a much harder question to answer. Um, right. You'd have vast debate about who mm -hmm. who even number one is. Who's number one? Yeah, I would say MJF. I mean, the and 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 one part of this right now is with AEW. We look at AEW like the last few months business trends is. AW is really in a like what I would consider like a rebuilding period in terms of they've got a lot of talents that they're trying to um, establish as main eventers um, with their audience. And they have a lot of people that had previously had that establishment that are either pretty dramatically phased down or not around at all. Like MJF just came back a couple weeks ago. Um, but obviously, you know, you put, you know, Samoa Joe was the world champion at the start of the year. Swerve beat him for the title. Um, you, you brought in Will Ospreay, who you're obviously going to give a really big push to. Um, so, but he's new to a lot of viewers. So you're trying to get his people off the ground. And then you have a lot of the people that were, um, you know, your major stars for the first five years of your company. Kenny Omega is, has been out. He's not around. Um, Hangman Page is not around. And then you have like people like Chris Jericho, Brian Danielson, John Moxley that are are phased pretty significantly down in terms of being away from title, uh, the world title picture. And um, someone like Moxley has not been on the product consistently um, since, um, you know, kind of winning the IWGP World Championship. So you really have like, an, in my opinion, right, right now, AEW is in like, our reestablishment period period uh, and it takes time to get people over and not all of those people are going to get over um and so i think that is a factor that aw really is kind of like rebuilding right now they're kind of enter they're looking at who is our next phase of top talent now that the existing top talent we have are either injury prone aging out or just not showing the same kind of drawing power because they've been, uh, you know, kind of stale. They're, they're, they're growing a little bit stale on top. Um, and I think that's a pretty significant factor when you look at some, some of the week to week business trends or even month to month. Um, but I do think like to, to address your original point, 
WWE does a really, really good job at making their top stars feel like top stars. Um, but one thought I have is that I don't know if AEW fans want that approach. When we talk about identity, what can you do different than WWE? WWE has been the company of Super Cena or Roman Reigns getting pushed above everyone else. Now Cody's on top. And AEW having a, a more, uh, you know, egalitarian approach to sh TV time and who gets to, to work main events and who gets to, to go over and things like that, I think is a in some ways an appealing benefit of the company in contrast to WWE. I don't know. Argue, like, what, what, what was the peak of AW's business? What what time frame was the peak of AW's business? This is a rhetorical um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, it. I mean, you could say this, like for ratings, the start. Um, but I think most people would point to right when CM Punk debuted, um, yeah. and then Brian Danielson debuted shortly thereafter. So you're looking at like the start of Rampage, which is like what the, August the fall. The fall of 2021, I would say. Yeah. Um, they're sell they're not selling if they're selling it out, but they're packing um Arthur Ashe and TV ratings are at their yeah. highest point. August 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 2021, right? Punk comes back in in August and then he, or maybe he comes back in July, and then they have the, the really big all um all out. You know, well, the first the, episode of Rampage is August in twenty twenty one. Okay, so that that wasn't August. Um mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Because I'm thinking my, my about my point is that you gotta really define who's yeah. the biggest star in AW. Everybody knows it's CM Punk. Mm-hmm. And his uh, his highest um yeah he i mean he, he he statistically definitely was the the biggest star in aw i don't know um how how much of a lesson you could take from that though because cm punk was uh, a former ww star who kind of had this artificial um drawing interest that was created because he decided not wrestle for eight years so i don't know if that's like something you can necessarily recreate uh again like, oh, can if we you, just use – if we just use point somebody... to an example in wrestling history where a company has significantly increased its business popularity, business, business, you know, stuff aside, mm -hmm. where it was done through an ensemble comparable to WWE's talent pool right now versus a really hot one or two or three stars. Yeah, I mean like like a, I would say like All Japan in the 90s. The South. Um, well, Mosao, Mosao, Kobashi, Kawada, screw Tawei. Yeah, so th so not three Taui. people. So like three people. And right, but relative, relative, card, it's, it's all Japan in the 90s. <laughs> relative equal. I mean, you could say like New Japan uh, in, in, in current, uh, not, not currently, sorry, uh, 2010's New Japan, right? Tanahashi kind Okada of first. Okada Tanahashi. No, Okada, no, Okada, Naito, Nakamura. Um, it's definitely Okada, Omega. though. Uh, people would dispute that. Like a lot of people, Tanahashi first. Tanahashi's over way, way more over first, and Nakamura is the way more over really first. The turnaround really starts Nakamura. when when Okada shows up. Well, the turnaround from like absolute death starts when Tanahashi really takes off, um, and then Okada helps take it to the next level. But then you had Nakamura. I mean, you have like Okada as champion, um, Okada versus uh, Stardust Genius Naito. Uh, you know, Naito wins the G1, and that's supposed to be the main event of the Tokyo Dome. And then the fans vote and decide that Nakamura versus Tanahashi for the Intercontinental title should be the main event of the Tokyo Dome. So at that point, like, I would definitely say Nakamura and Tanahashi were ahead of Okada and certainly ahead of Naito. And then Naito, when he comes back from Mexico and starts Los Angeles, really becomes the biggest draw, uh, at least uh, domestically, for for New Japan. I suppose. We're, we're still Olympics. talking about, uh, like, a, you know, three right, or like, four big stars. I can't even name who those four people – would would be in AEW right now, like maybe it's it, yeah. MJF was probably in there. Well, um, I think part of it is re, like, yeah, I mean, I mean, last year I feel like I'd be more confident in saying who those people were. I think now because of injuries and because of 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 trying to push some new people into positions, it's a little bit more up in the air. We're more like you know, WWF nineteen ninety six, nineteen ninety seven, um, than we are uh, you know Hulkamania era, um, or, or more like WWF like nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety five. Um, than we are like full blown like Hulkamania era, um, but again, like I don't, I don't see that necessarily as a problem, right? Like your your suggestion is like an individual or maybe like two individual big stars have historically been what have drawn to pro wrestling, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's pretty like I, like pretty much like an indisputable fact. There's plenty of examples we can show, and certainly if you go back to the territory days, you know, some someone getting really hot, a feud getting really hot, doing big business. Um, not entirely sure how relevant that is to AW or 
in like, has the wrestling business far. changed in such a way that the individual star the brand is the draw doesn't matter as much i mean the that definitely i think is a factor um i think obviously you want to have individual star power i just think the way ww i think the way ww so easily defines like cody rhodes as being the biggest star in the company is and it was very evident when they first um signed him back right and he was really hot and he was a big deal they had him in multiple segments they had him popping up on different shows they had him um they had a cody countdown clock for cody is going to appear in one hour and 10 minutes or, or whatever and so they really went all out and then it's like wow like cody really feels like this big individual star and i don't know if aw fans would respond the same way to that i think they're as a as a unit a little bit more sensitive to someone being pushed like that again, because I think that was a turnoff for, for a lot of WWE fans, the super Cena era or the LOL Roman wins kind of uh, era of, of pushing a singular guy ahead of everyone else, ahead of other people's favorites. And a lot of people now have, um, that's a different, I'll, I'll go on way too long of a tangent. So I won't even, I'll, I'll maybe save that for later, but I think like I think when they when MJF was the world champion last year, I think he was easily obviously the number one guy in the company. I think he had easily the most TV time, multiple segments on most shows. He had a long promo segment. He'd be backstage. He'd be on com commentary. He'd wrestle. Like he was um, everywhere. And I don't think fans responded that. I think part of it was because they found his work to be a little sports entertainment. -y. But I think a lot there were a lot of AEW fans that were like, I'm sick of seeing this guy all the time. I think that was the nature of the content, right? That it was so deviating from what people, a lot, a lot of people wanted out of AEW, yeah. which was. But I think a lot of it was marketed to be uh, said to be in interviews and stuff leading yeah. up to the debut of AEW to be a sports-like presentation, and you couldn't mm -hmm. get any further from that by you know looking at what, what they were doing at the time. Right, but I think a lot of that is volume coming from MJF. Um, if you had someone like, let's say, like a Brian Danielson or a John Moxley who was in that role. Um, that was maybe more sports-based entertainment. That was more defined with what maybe a lot of the existing AW fan base wanted. Uh, the reaction probably would have been different. But I still don't. I, I just don't know if AW's the successful AW business model is get a get a get a an individual star and just push him to the moon and and make him like the face of the company or or her the face of the company. Um, I'll tell you what they use Mercedes Monet like for the women's division at least she's she's everywhere um and they make sure she's on she has something every week that she's got her own little things in the the, the the uh during the ad breaks i do think that they're really going all out to she's easily the biggest star in the women's division at least from presentation perspective um yeah, I, I, mean, I think her, her sock has been diminished by appearing on TV. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. Um, well, that's that's a performance issue, not necessarily. A, yeah. Uh, well, okay. and and a, and a choice of how to present her to put her in positions mm -hmm. where she, she doesn't come across well. Yeah, um, but I don't I don't know if the like the, the the success of AEW is 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 built around that that very old fashioned model, for lack of a better term. I think it's a new wrestling company. I mean. The tangent that I was going to get on, which I avoided, but I'll bring it up now because it makes more sense, is it's funny the the individual stars don't feel like they have the same amount of drawing power that they did in the past. But it does feel like the I don't know, maybe this is just a symptom of social media. And that's not like indicative of the average wrestling fan, but the average wrestling fan feels more emotionally invested in talent and what happens to them than like it seems like in a long time. In terms of, oh, I really hope they don't they don't book this person to lose. I want to. I don't want to. Like it just feels like there's a lot more emotional investment, especially like in mid card talent or younger talent that they want to see get over. Um, especially in AEW, everyone seems to have their favorites. It's, it's 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 even though Tony is very protective of booking and he doesn't like beating people clean, which I think is a, a, a to his to the detriment of the company. It's like when someone like Ricky Starks loses, it's like, oh, no, they're burying Ricky Starks. Oh, it's terrible. You have like all these Ricky Starks fans that, you know, are very upset about it. And that can be said about like almost anyone on the, on, on the roster. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably it's, social media. I, I would say like yeah. at least in my world, which I try to avoid, is I would the, – the first thing I would say along those lines is that people are extremely devoted to wrestling companies, at least in, in terms of WNAW. Mm -hmm. If you put the initials WWE and AEW in the same tweet, 
your 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 social media day is going to be different uh because people feel very strongly about one or the other at least a lot of people enough yeah. to create significant engagement i think there's a lot of people that are i think a, a difference is i think there's a lot of people that are super duper pro wwe which makes them anti other wrestling promotions and i think there's a lot of people that are anti wwe i don't know how many people there are that are just like mindlessly pro aw anti all other wrestling promotions or at least anti WWE. the only time i've gotten a threat of violence so far that i'm aware of is from mm -hmm. somebody who's mad about something i said about aw which was perceived by this person to be anti aw mm -hmm. so i i've been surprised by the the vitriol yeah. coming from pro aw people of late i think like the 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 thing is, like, whichever company is embattled, whichever company's popularity is on the decline, like that, those are those are the crazy and angry people. And you know, there, there may have been in higher doses when when the momentum was in in, in reverse order when WWE was yeah. on the decline. Um, maybe because that audience is is just bigger, or who knows why. But mm -hmm. I I think you know the the people who are whose audience is not growing and who are, are people are, are perceived to, to be not on the, on the business rise. Those are the people who are mad about facts. <laughs> I got a question for you. Do you think Tony Khan made a mis has made a mistake in making himself so front and center? Absolutely. With AEW. I said it too quick. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, if there was one branding change now, maybe I, maybe I have a myopic view of this because I'm a member of the media but I think AW's brand would be tremendously benefited if he was for one thing. If I could change and recommend them to change some things uh, about mm -hmm. press conferences, he should not be sitting out there next to talent. It reinforces this view that he's a money mark that's just there to play with his friends in his playground. And him sitting there next to every talent reinforces that view. Um, I think that's pretty strong. I don't I don't I don't agree with that. He sits I don't next. think I don't it's think a that's perception. A, I'm not I don't, I don't think I don't think that's a I don't think that's a realistically damaging perception that like some dumb people are going to think that he's a money mark. I think there's other issues that come from. OK, him. well, I've got more. Yeah. He, I think. I think those press conferences should be way shorter. I think you should take like four or five questions like Paul Levesque does. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be greatly. Should they be like the questions Paul Levesque gets? <laughs> they should only be questions for me and they should be four or five. Um, I think I think it would be greatly to their benefit to put Brian Danielson uh or someone else as a as a public face of the company mm -hmm. like he is. He's the um, public face of the company, like Tony is the public face of the company. Yeah. I think he like is he's and the I, main spokesperson I think, for I think he should basically never tweet. Um I think he lacks an awareness about of, of how he rubs people the wrong way. He's a representative in a lot of ways of a lot of things to people in terms of being somebody who represents a vision of wrestling that the incumbent power in, in the wrestling business dislikes and has taught people to dislike. Um, that is a, a version of whatever people think like the internet wrestling fan is. Um, and I think him tweeting very often, you know, uh, in, it instigates that. Um and I think if Tony Khan was like almost never seen and, you know, maybe did like one interview a year or something like that, you know, like Nick Khan turns up like maybe twice a year or something like that. I think that would be, I think that would, would help maybe even help his, uh, not only his perception as a leader, but maybe the, the reality of him being a leader and that there's a little bit more mystique to it and that he's not somebody just, just available all the time, just saying, you know, whatever's on his mind and letting us know that there's a, um, a justified this is awesome chant happening right now yeah i think that in hindsight um tony being as public of a personality as he is is not helpful to aw i think that you know he, he, you said he rubs people he could potentially rub people the wrong way i think he does rub people the wrong way. well 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 obviously <laughs> in context yeah well like i think he def i think he definitely does like earnestly rub some people the wrong way and then there's other people that are just really eager to tear him down kind of regardless of of anything he actually does and we'll say to balance that not not to just like sit here and beat up tony khan but like there is the reason why aw has also worked is because mm -hmm. tony loves wrestling 
in a, in, a, in a deep way that a lot of people who are in wrestling and have been in wrestling for decades don't love it and have and should have and should have learned it and studied it. But you know, they they listened to to the people that were around them who, who did the yeah, same. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I... When we talked about the start about like why AEW is, is different, it's because the person with the money is also a huge wrestling fan that's chosen to spend their money this way. And I've always kind of pushed back on the idea of like, I don't think you could take another, per even if you took another startup wrestling company and it's like some billionaire was funding it or some giant company was funding it. Like, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't really have a lot of faith that they'd be able to pick the right people to be put in charge to present a product that would connect with an audience. And we can talk about AEW's business trends being negative. Um, and, and, you know, those are facts, but he, he has created a product that has connected with the audience, with an audience that, um, is, is much larger than a lot of people thought it would be, um, that does show a lot of stability, particularly in terms of like pay-per-view buys and things like that, that they continue to, 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 to be able to draw, um, and then the business had 18 know. years to, to get this right with most prominently mm -hmm. TNA and mm -hmm. didn't to this extent. TNA yeah. got on Spike TV and and did a lot mm -hmm. of things, but they didn't yeah. get to the point that AEW got in terms of being this no. prominent of a number two. No, I mean Dynamite is going to outlast Nitro for sure. I think in terms of overall episodes, I think that's like sometime next year it goes yeah. past Nitro. Um, but I think like he has become, but I, I do think like he he him becoming like he he always said I don't want to be a character on television, which. Mm -hmm. I don't think he really has. He has appeared on television, but I don't think he's he's never become like anything close to like a, you know a really major on screen authority figure with a major personality and things like that. But his, um, but I do think he has become a character for AEW because he has been so active in essentially being the primary, you know, p PR person for AEW in terms of what people think of when they think of AEW. I, I, I'm trying to envision like an AEW where Tony is a behind the scenes guy that people know he's in charge and know that he's booking. He, even if he wanted to do like, you know, he wanted to, to have a, to appear on Wrestling Observer Radio like once every six months and talk about booking and things like that. Um, that would be fine. But he's re been really aggressive in doing interviews he does the press conferences. He does the media calls. He does all this, and that's that's good for I think journalistic transparency. Um, Why do you think he I, does this though? I think it's I, because well, he, he wants. wants I know what you think. He wants credit. For, he wants credit. For okay, it. you know. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I know. I'm aware of this. Okay, he wants a lot of credit. Do you know who put those? Who helped save that woman's NWA pay per view? It wasn't Billy Corgan. I'll tell you that. I know that. wasn't 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 Billy old, old Billy Corgan. Um, it was one guy from from Illinois. It wasn't. It wasn't. But it wasn't Billy Corgan. The uh, um, but so. But I do think that that has. He's ultimately become a character. Like he's not an on screen character, but he is a character. It's and a character he's someone. In life. Yeah, he is. Um, and I think that's that ultimately has. Like, has that hurt the? I think maybe that has hurt the respect that he can command from talent. Um, although with CM Punk gone. And maybe some other malcontents having been shipped out. I don't know if like talent not having res respect for Co for Tony is a definitive major issue. Tony being able to like say no to talent, I think might be an issue. But like as far as like talent thinking that they can just bully Tony and, and and that kind of throws off the entire vibe of, of the company. I don't I can't say for sure that's an exact issue. Um but I think I do think AEW would be better off if the general public was relatively unaware of like Tony Khan's personality. Um, yeah. But yeah. And, and I also want to say like, and that's not to say like I dislike him or anything. No, my my no, interactions with with Tony have been just fine. Um, yeah, I probably I I I've never met Tony. I'd probably uh, I've never met like I've never like met Tony formally. I've talked to him before. Yeah. But, but, but when we interact, it's we're, we're yeah, cordial and nice I, to each other. If me and Tony were sitting next to each other on a flight, I'm sure we would have a, a grand old time together. Uh, you know, I would love to talk about all Japan in the 90s with him sometime. Yeah. Um, but I'll say that the, the, there's a, a big – the biggest internal risk, though, I think, to AEW, as it was for WWE, is whether the CEO stays in touch with what mm -hmm. his market wants. And I think based on some of his conduct – that we've seen up to this point, I think there's a pretty strong risk for a lack of awareness 
that you know of, of what kind of product needs to be put out here um now he's now they're not there at this point it's still within the realm enough um but that does seem to me like a risk that could pop up over the years and, and i want to make it clear that like what Tony is doing is extremely difficult and he's really learning on the fly. Like he's learning how to book a wrestling company on the fly. He's learning how to run a wrestling locker room on the fly. He's learning how to be the face of a wrestling promotion on the fly. Like this is all stuff that he, he's, he had never worked in the industry before he started this company, which in a lot of ways has probably benefited AEW for the reasons we discussed earlier. Um, but like, this is a really challenging thing that he's going, he's learning to do. Um, and so like, I think it's fair to to call out. I think what we've seen is some weaknesses or some mistakes that he's made, but I also want to point out that I don't know if there's a lot of people that would be doing a lot better in his position, um, given his lack of experience and given um, the way this industry works, that there were some people that were just absolutely never going to respect Tony Khan because he hadn't been in the wrestling industry for a while. And he was, you know, he's, he's the son of a really rich guy that is running this wrestling promotion. Um, but I, and I, and I have like a lot of, like in cases, like, I think the mistakes that Tony has made, they're not like disastrous. How could you possibly make these mistakes? Like we've seen in, uh, if you want to watch, if you want to watch the who killed WCW show, uh, you'll see a lot of those kind of mistakes. Um, but I mean, he's, he's, he's learning and he's adjusting on the fly. And I think. I think in like five years, the, comp the company is going to look radically different than it does now because I think Tony's going to be a completely different person. I have no reason to think he wouldn't be in charge um, anymore. I think he's still I, I think in charge. As, as time goes on and he becomes less of a new person in, in wrestling mm -hmm. and he, it, it's less that he's hiring people who he watched on TV, the more I think he will have a, 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 a healthy kind of distance between talent and that he'll – He'll be a, he could be a more effective leader, um, which is whatever the opposite of a risk is. That's a benefit as time goes on um, mm -hmm. to offset some other things, maybe. Yeah, and and as we've discussed before, the the pipeline of of people that like would be qualified to run a major wrestling company right now is really limited. Um, so, I mean, if he was, what do you, what do you mean by qualified? I guess is like he someone had, that. I think someone, there were a lot of people who could have been Tony yeah, if, he, if they with, just had access to those resources. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know a, a lot of podcast hosts that totally think that they could be. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking about like right now, like let's say Tony, like I mean, obviously like let's, just, let's say Tony is like, I'm really burned out. I, I can't be doing this anymore. I need like five years off. I need to take a year off from everything, from everything associated with AEW, not just like head of creative, but just like kind of everything being in charge of AEW. Like, you, like who would be like who would have the requisite experience to prove that they would be good in that position? Brian Danielson, I guess, is the first person. But, that comes but Danielson's on. only ever been a wrestler. I don't care. He, I, well, yeah, I would say that's not exactly true, well, is it? Well, he's he's had backstage. You know, he's a coach. I think right. Like, but but and I don't and I don't disagree with you that like I think like like he's Brian Danielson like. Yes, I would trust him doing a lot of things. Like, would you? Well, I would trust Brian Daniels. He's on the discipline best. committee. He's a discipline yeah. committee member. If, if 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 you had to pick one wrestler to pick you up at an airport, who would you trust the most to pick you up? Any wrestler in the world. Yes, but you can't already know them or have trained them. Okay. Okay. So no, like uh, someone that would you could some, like someone that people will actually know. Yeah. Uh, um, Who do you feel like is the most reliable person that says, sure, Brandon, I can pick you up at the airport. You're landing at 3.30. Just shoot me a text. I'll be right over there. John Cena. Oh, you think that? Yeah, you think he's, I he's think not... I think John Cena does what he plans to do, okay? <laughs> well, he's got that. Yeah, he has that. Uh, no, I, that's an interesting take. But, yes, he has that OCD that will, like, if he puts it on his schedule. Yes, I, he's would, doing would you, it. Would you trust The Rock? No, he's probably going to show up late, according yeah, to uh, the rap. <laughs> but like you, my point is like you would trust Brian Danielson. Like, oh, Brian Danielson. I mean, he gave me his word. I, I trust. I trust him. I mean, these guys are all professional liars, of course. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it had to be. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be someone you you don't know. It can't be like it can't be like Puff who you could just yell at if you didn't. He probably show up late. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
but but yeah, like Brian Danielson would be I would trust him, but there's no real evidence to suggest that he would be like um he could do that role. Like it's just it's not a the, those positions in pro wrestling people aren't really trained to be in them. Uh, I think. And it's like if Levesque, for whatever reason, Levesque is out of WWE and hit in that role, um, who steps in? Like maybe Shawn Michaels, but is Shawn Michaels' position tied to Levesque being in power at all? Is his um, position tied to not traveling too? I think is a question in Shawn Michaels. Yeah, well, case. yeah, but if he get, if give a lot of these guys, I feel like if given the opportunity, they would take it. Like it would probably be Paul Heyman or Bruce Pritchard if, if Levesque were to uh, retire on the drop of a hat. Yeah. Um, and you could say that those guys at least have a lot of backstage experience, although, like, I don't think Pritchard would have a lot of the same positive vibes from the fan base that I think is instrumental in helping Levesque kind of turn things around. Heyman would be, <laughs> Heyman would be an adventure. Uh, did you ever listen to the, uh, the Dax, one of the, it was like when Dax had his podcast and he was talking about the time when he was working in WWE and Paul Heyman was in charge. And he's, no, he talked, I listened to like, I listened to three wrestling podcasts. And, no, and, I didn't. I to, I didn't listen. To, I don't listen to. I didn't listen to a show, but I did listen to this because it's a hilarious story. He tells about how like he was. He he told Heyman was in charge of Raw, and Dax said like you know he he, he gave advance notice like I'm not going to be at Raw this state or whatever. I have to go do something. And like the night before, Heyman was called him on the phone and was like, "You gotta you gotta come to you gotta come to Raw. I need you at Raw." And Dax is like, "I told you I can't come to Raw. I told you that I was like I wasn't going to be available this week." And Dax says that Heyman had had a very obvious like fake conversation, like he was pretending to talk to Vince off the phone, like oh I'm t I'm trying to get him to come, Vince. He's saying he's not coming, and like Dax like immediately knew it was fake. Um, I think that Heyman was this when he was executive director or whatever. Yeah, like for like for like a few weeks, and like that like there are there've got to be so many stories from from that time of him. I can't imagine him running the whole thing. I think he's found a good role for himself as an advisor to people who have a lot of stroke in the company. He is an advisor and an advocate to people who should believe in them even more than they actually do believe in them because I believe he's a, you know, a very convincing person I've heard. Yeah, I mean, he's a, uh, he's, 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 as for someone that had a really hard time staying employed in different roles for most of his wrestling career, he has finally found a tremendous niche for himself, which is being friends with people that have a lot of, uh, negotiating power within wwe um where where do you see um just because we talk a lot about AEW, but i won't wrap up talking about something about wwe we talked about this a lot uh back when i was a regular co-host for wrestlenomics i think i even had you on this show and we talked about talent development mm -hmm. where do you currently stand on wwe's current like ability to develop talent to get people invested in talent and ultimately find people that can replace some of the more established talents if whether they age out or with tko in charge or decide that they're not no longer worth the money that they want um if, if i wanted to give you a provocative answer i would say they should treat aw as their developmental organization mm -hmm. um in a lot of ways i think that's true like that's what they should do mm -hmm. um they can get talent from AEW in like what they did with Cody, insert them. And, and yeah. to the extent that they can do that or continue to do that, they're, you know, defining that this is the step up, you know, even more so. Um, mm -hmm. Have we now, have they signed any significant AEW wrestler that, wasn't previously in WWE. I guess Ethan Page would be that would be the guy. Jade Cargill. Oh yeah, Jade. Yeah, I forgot about Jade. Um, yeah, Jade's Brian, a good example. Brian Pillman Jr. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I guess that's true. I was thinking of him as an ex WWE. Guy. I was thinking about those NXT guys like you know Brian Pillman Jr. and Ty and Sean Spears. Um, and those people like they poached Cody, and obviously there was a familiarity with Cody and Vince had a relationship with Cody, and and kind of was able to convince him to come back. Um. But I do wonder, like, Ricky Stark's contract situation seems to be uh, uncertain. Um, mm -hmm. But without – I don't know anything about that, so I'm not going to speculate on what I think is going to happen. But I do think that there is room on WWE's card right now for someone like Ricky Starks in a way that there might be not room for in AEW. I think AEW has a lot of people competing for 
top spots. And I think someone like Ricky Starks, who's a very good promo that I think could connect with the WWE audience. Um, I think he could come in and really get like a big push. And I think that would be a huge sign to the um, AEW younger AEW wrestlers. It's like, okay, I should definitely go to WWE because I would say Cody is doing great, but he might not be the best example. Like Jade. Okay. I guess Jade is doing good. I, I think she's destined to being uh, a mid Carter in, in WWE. I don't, they haven't I don't put her on NXT. It. They could have done less. Yes, they could have. They, maybe they should have. Um, they kept her off TV for like yeah. They kept her months? off TV for like I like that's a whole different situation. They, but like, I, I don't like, know if they, like, they retrained her from scratch if, or what. If you're looking like at what happened to Andrade, <laughs> if you're looking at like what what's on what Andrade has been up to, I wouldn't say that's necessarily like if I'm a mid Carter in AEW, I'm like oh man, I could go to WWE and go do what Andrade is doing, or I could, oh. even if I was like I could go do what Ethan Page. If you is were doing. in AEW when Andrade was, maybe you know some background information that would inform what's happening with him right now. Mm-hmm. Um, some cryptic Thurston. I don't know anything, but you know that's the reputation is that he's yeah. you know he's unhappy. It, it, yeah, I, 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 right. And I would say like even like or like whatever. You look at Sean Spears, look at Brian Pillman. Like I guess those guys are getting have gotten some. I mean Brian Pillman when he first showed up in in NXT like was given some time, but I don't I don't see a super bright future for him in WWE. Um, of course, if you're a wrestler, maybe like I'm more talented than Brian Pillman, so it won't matter. I'm sure a lot of wrestlers believe that. Um, but I don't know if I'd like to see it happen at least once with like a, a with someone that's not Cody that's like a major male wrestler star because um, I do think the opportunity is there. Like I think like if Ricky Starks were to go to WWE, I think he'd be much more likely to win one of their world titles than he would be to win the AEW title currently. Yeah, I I think there's like there was for for Cody's situation. There was not just a reason to promote Cody to become a big star that would be beneficial in the internal isolated world of WWE. Mm-hmm. But it was, it had to be a message to be like, a we're not, point. we're not going to put you in yellow polka dots and, you know, and have you doing whatever Dusty Rhodes was doing in, in 1989 um, mm-hmm. where you can become the biggest star in the company. Yeah. And, that, and that's the message right now. But I do think, and then we're seeing, I think, I think it's kind of going to be, we're going to see it. Um, more i think with the way tko does business that wrestlers that are older that are making a lot of money like i'll use randy orton as an example like vince would have never gotten rid of randy orton like i don't think he ever would have like been like we're sorry randy you want too much money bye um but tko absolutely i could see them doing that and i do think that they're going to be looking at like, who can we get to replace these people? I mean, I, I find the cards in WWE pretty dry at the moment in terms of, like, interesting wrestlers. Um, especially kind of, you know, with with the part-time guys not around. Um, uh, and, and the novelty, like, I think, like, the novelty of Logan Paul is is, 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 is is has worn off a little bit. Not to say that he's still not useful, but he's not nearly Things have as just been freshened up with the, the Wyatt Six. That's, I mean, that that's a point i mean that i think i think raw needed something different to happen especially with cody going from raw to smackdown and you look at the trends of what raw's businesses were business were um, or is, is something different for sure um it is something somebody that if you were not particularly creative would want to try again i would say this is an idea that i can have a group a group another group in wwe to come in and to to, to feud with your other groups and to um do you think they'll do like bloodline level drama like like or, or soap opera level drama within the wyatt six as they do like in, with the bloodline and what they've done with judgment day where like the, the wrestlers are jealous of each other I, I i i have no idea but i can't wait to see how it all unfolds and uh and how is is chad gable alive is is the biggest question on my mind right now is he has, just resigns look, so well he, he appears to have been shot in the temple so uh, hopefully there's some follow-ups uh, this coming Monday. Yeah, how do you think they're going to follow it up? If you took over booking, like you took over booking, they're like, Brandon, we need you to run Raw now. And like your job is to 
follow up what we saw? What would you say? What would you have happen? I, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm like so not interested in in the in the content of wrestling mm-hmm. these days. I'm like shocked I at how you're, much I do you're, not a, care. you're a very you're just you're like one of those people that likes baseball but doesn't I, watch any of the games. I'm they so just like over the statistics it. of it. You should ask John Pollock. We went to Ring of Honor, and I sat there on my laptop, and I worked on spreadsheets, and I, and I watched WNBA on my phone at, at a Ring of Honor show. Don't tell Tony Khan that. Um, I'm just the, the content is not the story to me. It's the it's the stuff that the content is delivered on is the story to me, and and the yeah. power of the people involved in what they're doing. When are you coming out of retirement to wrestle Never. Yuji Nagata? Never. So you're, you're, you're uh, well. A wrestler telling me that they're never retired is, is certainly something I would trust. Um, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't. Uh, and I think that's kind of like what it makes it really easy to not wrestle again. I think, and, and I think there was that was kind of a weakness in my ability to perform as a wrestler in that I was not like creatively engaged in the idea of creating matches because i wasn't so engaged in in caring about the content i kind of i kind of look back you shouldn't, on, you on shouldn't my... be focused on matches you'd be focused on telling stories brandon well in the in the isolated realm of performing in matches um yes but but also telling stories and things of that nature um now, now you made your you, to be fair you made your aew dynamite debut I heard that. Yeah, I, I was actually. I had it on TV. I was like looking down. <laughs> what? And, I, and I got, I got DMs like, yeah. "You were on Dynamite." I was like, "What?" I, I knew that. So they did a segment on, on Daniel Garcia, yeah. who I who I helps train, and I knew that like Grapplers was on TV. And he was like being filmed in a video package on at mm-hmm. at the training school, mm-hmm. um, but I was not looking at the screen at the time that my uh, likeness appeared on TBS. Yes, for for people who didn't see it, they showed a they were doing a story on on Daniel Garcia, um, and they were talking about this you know the the whole whole background of how he broke both he broke both of his legs I think yeah. in, a, in, a, in a really bad car accident coming back from a booking, uh, and there's a photo of him at the training school in a wheelchair surrounded by a bunch of what I presume are a bunch of wrestlers and other people at the training school. I'm and Brandon people recognized me. Like, Brandon is one of those people. Uh, I was looking looking for, looking for you because I saw when I saw because because when I was watching it and. Daniel Garcia says like grapplers anonymous and I'm like, Oh, okay. Like it's not oh, like a like, big close up picture. It's a group. I like, picture I like perked up though. Cause I'm like, away. Oh, that's Brandon's school. Like I wonder if Brandon's going to be there. And then like, of course the photo, I'm like, there he is. So mm-hmm. um, you're on the payroll now. No. You're uh there's you're no royalties AEW. that I'm aware of yeah. that will be if you were paid a, to if me. You if were, there are royalties, I will yeah. return them. Mm-hmm. You're if you were an indie, you're still doing indie bookings. You would charge a, a bigger fee cause you've been on national TV. Um, you're, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised none of like the really bad grifters or, or troll accounts have they have they discovered that you were on AEW Dynamite yet? I don't, not that I know of. Yeah, we'll see. You can't believe anything that Brand Thurston said. He was on Dynamite. They already have enough reasons to not believe me. But yeah. Um, okay, are you going to be at? A, are you going to Forbidden Door? No, I thought about it, but I was going to go to it if it was at Arthur Ashe, but they put it on Long Island. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I would stay that with my aunt in Manhattan. I'm not going oh, to yeah. Long Island. Yeah, that Forget extra, that extra bitch to to, to to trip to to New. Not New figuring Island. that out. No, no. And the sh- and I, I'm sure the show is going to be like five hours long. There's going to be mm-hmm. like a two hour press conference. No. no. I'll p- turn on my VPN and and, and order the people. Mm. Apros or nothing. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, I went to the Lana Del Rey concert last night at Fenway Park. Um, and I had never been to a like pop concert before. Um, and were tickets I was, expensive? They were very, very expensive. I, bet. That, I got that's them the business today. Yeah. I got them as an extremely generous gift from my sister for my 30th birthday. Um, uh, but I mean, I don't know what the gate, I would like to know what the gate total was. Well, she got hers on the secondary market, um, which she paid a huge amount of money for. Um, the tickets were not as expensive. You got them uh, right at, on the presale, but they pretty much instantly sold out. Um, she's not on tour. So this is like a one night only concert. So like a lot of people, I talked to some girls from Buffalo that flew in just to see the concert. Oh, wow. um, so there are people like that. And, but I did, when I was there, I never been to a pop concert before and like, the sheer enthusiasm and like idol tree that people had for her 
in the audience was something that I had never seen before. And it made me think about pro wrestling and like, even like a wrestler that's like really over in the building at shows I've been at, like are nothing compared to the emotional investment that a lot of these, these you know, 40,000 people have in this, this singing performing artist. And it was making me think about like, you, you should go to Taylor Swift concert then. Well, I assume the Taylor Swift concert is like that magnified. And my sister, it's who like a it. religious experience, people but that's out. what, it, but, but I, and I assume a lot of popular pop artists are like yeah, this, yeah, especially, yeah. but I was thinking like a rest, we need to, there needs to be, if they're a wrestler, I guess this is probably like what the crush gals were like. Hmm. Um, but I was like, if a wrestler could capture this kind of fan base and fan power, they would become like the most successful wrestler in history. Um, I have Lana Del Rey at the PNC Music Pavilion in Charlotte, North Carolina in September, drew a one and a half million dollar gate for 18,940 paid, according to Polestar. What was that? A one point? One point five, six. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not one, one and a half million dollar gate. This, this year? Uh, 2023, September. Yeah. That's not that much, actually, if I'm being honest. Like, this is know. not a stadium. You went to a stadium. Yeah. It sounds like. Yes, this is, I believe, was her first proper stadium show. It was at, it was at Family Park. Um, and she didn't go on until 1030 because it was pouring rain and thunder and lightning. So I spent actually a, a, a large portion of the time I was there. I was uh, huddled in a, in a causeway um, inside Family Park with the water leaking down on top of me because it's a 112-year-old uh, baseball park. Um, but a memorable experience nonetheless. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I don't even have the gate. I would say the gate, I mean, if it was, if that using that PNC park evaluation, then the gate would at least be three or $4 million because she had double the people. It's hard to tell. I was, I was talking to my sister. My sister was there with me and this says an average ticket price of $81 when you calculate it. The, uh, the PNC park one mm -hmm. or PNC pavilion. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, my, we were, uh, they, uh, they wall off like a pretty large, pretty much the entire outfield bleachers because um, there's a big stage and there's they, they funnel people onto the field through ramps that are through there. And my sister was saying, I was my sister's like, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if there's more people here than there would be for a baseball game. And she's like, well, there has to be. Look, they put seats on the field. And I said, seats on the field don't necessarily mean because look at how many of those seats are walled off. And I went to explain production kills. Yep. I was I was explaining. I was like, you have to understand how efficient all those seats in the bleachers are, as opposed to these chairs that are just on the ground. Yeah. On the ground, like there's a lot more people can fit in those bleachers than they can fit on the fields. And I said, Russell people takes. tend. To, I did. I was I was going on like I was like, I was like, people tend to overestimate how many seats can fit on a on a field. They just assume it's like you know, tens and tens of thousands and thousands of seats. And it's like it's usually I feel like for the most part that it's overestimated. Um, um, do you have anything you want to plug? I imagine most of my uh, viewers are, are ready for it. Are you, are you raising your prices uh, on your on your uh, page like uh, Pressing Observer Newsletter is? No. Uh, in, in fact, Patreon, as I understand it, makes it basically impossible to do that. Like if I wanted to raise my $5 tier, mm -hmm. I don't think I, I could. I could make a new tier and close the $5 tier and say here's a $6 tier that you can sign up mm -hmm. for. And I think I could do that. But I think everybody's sort of, you know, if, if you signed up at that rate, you're stuck there forever if you want to be. Um, I don't know. Patreon.com slash WrestleNomics. I just wrote a thing. If, if you're uh, worried about the AEW ratings crisis, um, I've got some information there for you, including quarter hours and a big breakdown of uh, the, the latest direly low AEW uh, rating, including some commentary on whether or not AEW is dying. Um, yeah, that's that's the the, the most of it. Uh, the Pollock and Thurston is every Wednesday on post wrestling and WrestleNomics platforms. We talk about uh, wrestling business and things of that nature. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Brandon. I always want to appreciate you being on the show. Um, yeah. I want to thank all my listeners and I'll talk to them again after a while. See you.